Here comes the rundown. Welcome to the Success 101 Podcast. This is your host, Jared Warren. Thanks for joining me here today. Now let's kick things off. Guys, welcome back to the rundown. So excited to be here with you today. I'm your host, Jared Warren. And I'm Bo Coleman. We are on Google+, Stitcher, iTunes, SoundCloud, and a ton of other stuff that hasn't even been invented yet. You can find us there in the future. Guys, this episode is brought to you by the Human Charger. It is white light, blue infused light, five times fast. White light, blue fleece light, white light, blue fleece light. (laughs) Close, not even two. It's science. The cool thing is you can put these LED earbuds into your ear canals or seriously up your nose, but that just looks goofy, I which I did. And what was the outcome? Did you get charged up? It smelled like ears. (laughs) So seriously, you put these in your ears if you're commuting, if you are uh, working out, whatever it is that you're doing. Nobody knows that you're doing this, but it's going to get you charged up. Head to success101podcast.com forward slash human charger. Enter the promo code success101 at checkout. You're going to get 20% off of the sun in your pocket. So you said it's like having the sun in your pocket. That's right. It's like that song. I got a pocket, got a pocket full of sunshine. I don't know, no, what's wrong, I know. <laughs> This show is also brought to you by Ample. My good friend, Johnny Ampleseed, uses Ample. It's a game changer when it comes to the meal supplement industry. And the cool thing is, the thing I love about it, Bo, is you can get awesome ingredients on this from all over the world that you're not going to find at your local market, especially where you shop. But I can probably go to like Market Street. Wait, what is it? Central Market. I can probably go to like Central Market. No, there's seriously, guys, if you go on to Ample's website and you look at what's in this, it's not only the ingredients. Those are awesome in and of themselves. But if you look at the type of ingredients that they've blended together to give your brain and your body peak performance, first of all, you'd have to go find all the ingredients, which you can't do. Secondly, you'd have to put it in the exact formula that they have in order to fuel you up. And I'd encourage you to go check it out. Head to success101podcast.com forward slash Ample. And at checkout, enter Success 101. You're going to grab 15% off of your 400 or 600 calorie shake. And I want you guys to write into me after you've gotten your shipment to let me know how it's changing your mornings as you use this as a total meal replacement shake. They're awesome. Guys, today we're going to do things a little bit differently. So I'm going to read a story to Jared based on things that have happened this week throughout history, the last week of January. And Jared has no idea what the story is. No clue. I'm a little nervous about this. Jared, are you ready for this? January 1879. Lord Frederick Augustus Thesiger Chelmsford. I cannot spell my own name. (laughs) Lord Chelmsford arrived at Rourke's Drift. Rourke's Drift was a former trading post that had been converted into a mission station located on the Buffalo River in South Africa. Okay, so we're in Africa. Like around Cape Town or... The Buffalo River. Uh, Yeah, I... I, Okay. Me neither. So, the mission sat smack dab on the border between the British colony of... Smack dab! Man, are we in Texas or Africa? Oh, smack dab. Border. The mission sat smack dab on the border between the British colony and the Zulu kingdom. Tensions were high. 1879, there's a border between Britain or British territory and Zulu. You gotta think that there's something... Tension-wise, it's about to happen there. Sir Henry Bartle Frere was pretty much wanting to start a fight, so he told the Zulu king that if he did not disband his army, he would send his forces to invade Zululand. Frere sent Lord Chelmsford to invade Zululand across the river from... Wait, was it really called Zululand? It was really called That Zululand. sounds like a theme yes. park. I, I read this, and I was like, no way. And I double-checked, and 100% it is Zululand, and it does sound like what kind Disney's of newest attraction. Zululand? What kind of rides do you think they have at Zululand? The bamboo shoot? A hundred percent the bamboo shoot. I picture that as a log ride. I Yeah, the bamboo shoot is the main attraction, actually, in Zululand. You can go and you can get your face painted like a warrior's, you know? I think Mike Tyson went and did that once. Mike Tyson did do that. 
he has not showered that side of his face since he came back, so he has kept it. Wow. Everyone's just assumed it's a tattoo. Sweet. <laughs> On January 20th, Lord Chelmsford took 350 men, and they marched to Islandawana, leaving behind Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead. Ah, these names. This is actually how my wife finds out that we're going to name our first child Gonville. <laughs> Gonville Coleman. Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead and a small force of men were stationed to garrison the fort in Lord Chelmsford's absence. Brevet Major Henry... So wait, where did he go? This guy declares war on Zululand and then just leaves? So he invaded Zululand. Like, if you look on a map, it's like not even an inch. <laughs> I thought it'd be further than that. <laughs> They camped on the riverside, and they just sat there. Okay. For literally about 10 so, days. But they haven't actually attacked yet. They have not attacked okay. yet. No, okay. they just they just invaded, and they can turn around and wave with their buddies back in the British colony. Brevet Major Henry Spaulding was left in charge of Rourke's So drift. the guy left behind. That's right, yeah. The guy left in charge was Brevet Major Henry Spaulding. Brevet. Lieutenant John Chard had originally been instructed to march to Las Londawana, however... He was sent back to Rourke's Drift, as it was believed that he wasn't needed on the front and would instead be needed to help fortify the defenses. Okay. Is okay. Londa is Londawana? I told my wife that once whenever we were going on vacation to the Caribbean. I said, is Londawana? And she's like, you want to go to an island? I'm like, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. On January 22nd, Major Spaulding, remember? Yes. Brevet Major. Was becoming frustrated at the fort. Some reinforcements were overdue, and so he left to look for them, leaving. Lieutenant Chard in charge. There was an awesome show on back during the 80s or early 90s called Charles in Charge. Did you ever see it? Charles in charge of our lives <laughs> in a day. Soon after his departure, survivors from Islandawana arrived with news of the defeat and that part of the Zulu tribe was on their way. On their way where? To Rourke's Drift. So basically what happened was all these British troops went to go fight in this battle of Islandawana, they got massacred. And you'll find out later, I mean, it was a it was a slaughter. I mean, what are they what are the Zulus fighting with at that point? Eighteen hundreds, they've got spears, they've got some drums. Uh, I, I have it later on, but basically it's oh, just short ahead. spears and shields. And that's it. That's but really the, it. Eighteen hundred the British are gonna have guns and they they're will gonna have, guns, have yeah. And they still got beat. They overpowered them. They overcame them. They were greater in number, greater in strength. So anyways. Is, Islanda wanna became Islanda don't wanna. Islanda wanna became Islanda don't wanna. Islanda don't wanna and a wanna runna. <laughs> so with all those guys that came back, they basically started to help fortify Rourke's drift because it was the next checkpoint that the Zulu were coming towards. So upon hearing the news, Lieutenant Chard and Brom had discussed what they should do. Retreat? Or defend their position. Yeah, Zulu because the warriors. Zulus are probably fighting like guerrilla war tactics, right? Oh. I mean, they're they're all hiding out and they're doing their Dude, war. I screams. never understood why the British wanted to do that. Even in like the Revolutionary War, you walk out in these columns, everyone falls down. The next column steps up, everyone falls down, and then it's just like whoever has the most numbers wins. You got all these crazy guys running at you, and you're just like, mm, yes, I'm just gonna put the gunpowder in this gun and I'm going to shoot. <laughs> there were all these rules of war and like gentleman war. So you have the French and Indian war. You've got literally people on the French side that are covering themselves in bear grease so that if they get in hand to hand combat with the British, they're hopefully slipping off of them and stuff. And the British had no idea how to handle any of that. They're like, ah, oh, what is this? You're supposed to be in a it's column. Ah, Tiffy Taddy. <laughs> Tiffy Taddy. It's not fair. Tiffy Taddy. You're cheating. I need a T. Ah, crumpets. That's how this was pretty much going, too. So orders were shouted by Lieutenant Chard. I'll tell and... the queen on you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that chap over there, he wasn't playing very sporting like. Let's arrest him. Oh, I just got a spear through my ribs. This is unfortunate and unfair. Oh, I'm dying. I'm bleeding out. <laughs> The men started knocking out holes into the external walls so they could shoot through them with the rifles, you know, at the, the, Zulu. At the advancing Zulus from their fort. You know, so they're building the walls and they already had like the stone walls and they were just taking sledgehammers to it to put holes in it so they could, you know, oh, I do that. I, I, I'm, yeah. OK, they're finally doing something smart. As if prayers have been answered, a hundred more British troops showed up and volunteered to help fortify the back wall. We will help you build up this defensive position. 
But because... we'll stand back at the back wall. <laughs> that's, that's right. We're going to go over Because here. we got to collect our military check, but we're getting smarter by the day. Exactly. So they were anxious, and they wanted to put a lot of the wall between themselves and the warriors. So then the Zulus showed up. 4,000 strong. 4,000 4, wow. strong in numbers. This was the small part of the tribe that they had originally told him about earlier. Wow. Small part. Is it smallpox uh, that the British are about to put on them? <laughs> or there's no chemical warfare here. Well, smallpox pretty much was. It would have That won. started with Christopher Columbus. It would have won, but it would have taken a little bit of time for it to start taking it. All they had to do is give them blankets like Christopher Columbus did. It's pretty much exactly Have these blankets. Welcome us to your country. Oh, why do I have bumps on my face and my body? Why am I dying? Da -da 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 -da. Smallpox. <laughs> so these 4,000 Zulu, they show up from the Islanda Wana battle. Islanda Wana battle. The Islanda Wana battle. The Islanda Wana battle. The Islanda Wana battle that had happened, the massacre over there, all the British that had retreated, this was the small part of the tribe, the 4,000 strong, and they caught them right at Rourke's Drift. So most of the warriors, warriors, they were, what not were they worried about? Too worried. Oh, God. It's not like they're in control here. Not the other guys. Right. So most of the warriors, they were armed with sharp, short spears and shields made from cowhide. Some even had firearms. A couple of the Zulus even had we're, guns. We're, hey, guys, check out what we got over here. <laughs> Don't ask us where we got them from. A couple of the Zulus had guns. However, most Zulus Dude, did where did not, they get those? You know, trading. No. <laughs> finding them. No, if you're them. trading, then more of them have guns. When they kill British troops at Islandawana. They pick up guns, probably that. I don't know. Okay, but probably that. Overall, the Zulus did not really agree with using firearms. Oh, their thinking was that firearms were, quote, the arms of a coward, for they enable the patroon, which is another word for coward, to kill the brave without awaiting his attack. So basically, they saw it as a way to kill someone before you bravely awaited his attack. Yeah, that's noble. That's cool. A hindsight right? 2020, though. That seems brave, but we're going to lose our entire territory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's exactly what the hindsight. We will be brave. Says. Prince Dabula Manzi. Dabula Oblongata. <laughs> uh, he was the king's brother-in-law. Uh, well, he was responsible for leading this tribe, this small part of the tribe of Zulus into battle. And he was specifically known for being rash and aggressive, which did not spell well for the fortified British troops in this tiny, tiny fort. So at about 4 p.m., Otto Witt, who was the Swedish missionary from Rourke's Drift, reported that the tribe was... Quote, oh, now the Swedish have gotten involved. Now the Swedish have gotten involved, and this is missionary. And he goes on top of this hill, and he sees that the troop is, quote, no more than five minutes away. And at that point, Witt decided it was pretty much time for him to leave to go rejoin with his family that was about seven miles southwest. Seven miles. That's a that's that's quite a ways for you to travel on foot when the enemies when the Zulu land kingdom is right upon you. Yeah, yeah. The whole kingdom. Well, if no, a he, kingdom's upon me and I've got to go seven miles, I'm. It, it's almost like when someone tells you a nuclear bomb is falling on your country and you right. try to run away from it, mm -hmm. you might as well just say, "Where's the nuclear bomb?" and try to catch it, <laughs> because you're going to be better <laughs> off than trying to run away from it. I can guarantee you. I've never thought about that. Absolutely. My new objective when that happens. If a nuclear missile is coming down on your territory, don't try to run from it. Get underneath it and catch that thing. You'll be better off. Say so this guy sees that these, these troops are like no more than five minutes away. And he goes back to the you know mission. He's like, yeah, they're pretty close. You know what? I'm out of here. I'm, I'm gone. Oh, there goes the man of God. Let's all leave. That's the best wartime decision. <laughs> <laughs> then another 250 guys they left they were like oh they're leaving we should go too hey and man where are they going and they just went so after they hightailed it the guys who were planning on staying were watching their friends retreat just run away from these 4,000 zulu they got a little bit upset about it screw those guys where are they going and they started shooting at them let me reload my musket hang on someone else fire Anyone else got some gunpowder? Wait a minute. Joe is still loading. Okay. Joe, uh, are you loading up still? Uh, 
Are you almost ready to fire? Uh, no. Uh, hopefully sometime you fire on these guys. Oh, they're already gone. Never mind. <laughs> they end up killing Corporal William Anderson, who was in charge of the 250 that left second. He's gone. So the garrison that had been filled with 500 men only minutes earlier was now left with only 150 because 350 had vanished. We like shall that. stay till the end and we shall fire on those that leave as soon as we get our musket balls loaded and our gunpowder loaded. Which is wasting ammo, by the way. Like they have all these 4,000 Zulus <laughs> running at them and they're. We have nothing else to fire at them. <laughs> they're shooting their ammo at their retreating friends. Quick, it's more important to fire at our and men. They- I'm about principle here. I know the queen would approve. Shoot a tower, men, for character. By the way, of the 150 men that were left, 39 of them were actually patients in the hospital that was attached (laughs) to Rourke's Drift. (laughs) So they're totally useless. I cannot fight when I do not have any arms. Put the gun in my teeth and I shall try to fire, not guaranteeing anything at this point. (laughs) So the advance from the Zulu forces began around 4.30 p.m. So the plan was to effectively surround the fort and overwhelm the minuscule force of the British. Well, the British were soon engaged in hand-to-hand combat in a number of places, especially where the wall was weak. (laughs) Except for the guys that are laying in beds that have no arms. I would be involved in hand-to-hand combat, though I have no arms, so I will play toe wars with you if you show up and try to fight me. (laughs) The walls were too high for the Zulus to climb in some of the places, so they began trying to crouch down and grab the British Ah, ah, from underneath Ah, by their feet. I will get you. The hospital was on fire at the time. (laughs) (laughs) It only gets worse. (laughs) As night fell, the attacks from the Zulu became stronger and more persistent. They only began to soften after midnight, finally ending at around 2 a.m. Those well, guys should have taken over the entire place. They were just trying to find a way in. They just got for tired. For some reason, with the burning hospital and with the windows that were open and the knock holes that had been knocked <laughs> open by the British, they just couldn't penetrate the fort area. By that time, the British tallied their losses. 150 British soldiers, 4,000 Zulu, right? Yep. 14 dead of the British. But, however... Of the 150 that were there, almost every man had some kind of wound on him. Ah, it's merely a flesh wound. (laughs) In the morning's first light, the British could see that the Zulus had gone, leaving only the dead and severely wounded. The Zulus returned on top of the hill. (laughs) Lay them back! Everyone (laughs) retreat or die! (laughs) However, no attacks formed. As the Zulus were tired, hungry, wounded, and they were also like two days from supplies, Zulu casualties reportedly ranged around 600 to 875 killed by the 150 at work's drift. 150 guys, they lose 14. 4,000 Zulus, they lose 875. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So Lieutenant Chard and Bromhead received the Victoria Cross, as did nine others. And there were also four distinguished cross medals that were also awarded during that battle as well. Lieutenant John Chard, a lifelong pipe smoker, he was diagnosed with cancer on the tongue. <laughs> well, there were things were going so well for these guys. This is years later. Why, uh, why ruin it, man? Diagnosed with cancer on the tongue in 1897. He underwent two surgeries, the second of which removed his tongue completely. Wow. Yet it was said that he could still speak clearly however the cancer was found to be terminal and he died on november 1st of oh god it's all gonna come to an end thanks for joining us here on children's story hour <laughs> <laughs> to end the podcast jared today in history dead on this day still dead Death of Winston Churchill, former oh, prime man. minister of England. Holy cow. Winston Churchill is probably one of the most fascinating characters for me in history. I cannot get enough. Of we Winston need to do Churchill. an entire podcast on that because I've got the whole timeline in history of Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt. And we're all at war. Churchill literally got screwed because Churchill is the just United the States and the Russians were trying to set themselves apart and really just pushed Great Britain 
completely out of the picture. Churchill is just, in in my opinion, he's one of the most fascinating characters in history to me. I just, I cannot, we've got to do a podcast on him at some point. We have to. He is one of those people who just he, like he sticks out to me. Like I need to know more about him. I love the way he's been portrayed in the show The Crown on yep. Netflix. Yep. It's so freaking interesting. Like I just Winston Churchill is one of those guys to me where anything that he quotes or or you know anything that covers with what he's an awesome guy. Yeah, if you look at the history on him, he's just he's unbelievable. So, guys, thanks so much for joining us here on the Rundown Part Three. If you want to connect with us, send us an email at info at success one hundred one podcast dot com. We'll catch you guys on the next awesome episode. Until then. (laughs) 